everyone. I'm Kelly Weiss. I'm the Executive Director of Marketing and Communications here at the School of Law. And thank you all for joining us for our Racial Justice Speaker Series uh, with Professor Fairfax. I'm going to give a few quick ground rules before we get started. Um, everyone will be on mute throughout this presentation. Once Professor Fairfax has uh, presented her talk, we will open for questions. The way we'll be accepting questions is through our chat function, and those questions will come to me uh, so that I can read them for Professor Fairfax, um, and, and we will uh, give that reminder as well as we are nearing the end of Professor Fairfax's presentation. Um, so that's, that's about it for how things will go with the formatting. And now I would like to introduce Dean Kevin Johnson. Good, ap good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, and welcome to the latest uh, episode in the Racial Justice Speaker Series. What, last summer, when violence uh, and protests following the killing of uh, a number of black people occurred, we decided to institute this racial justice speaker series. Uh, our community was troubled, deeply troubled uh, by the events last summer. And what we've tried to do over the last few months is to gather leading voices on civil rights, criminal justice, civic governmental responsibility, um, and today corporate responsibility. The goals of our series are to inform, enlighten, and engage the community in a conversation about racial justice in the United States. Now, the title of our talk today is Racial Reckoning with Economic Inequities, Board Diversity as a Symptom and Partial Cure. Our speaker, we're very lucky to have this speaker, is Lisa Fairfax, the Alexander Hamilton Professor of Business Law at George Washington University Law School. Now, in response to the racial reckoning relating to the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other unarmed black men and women over the summer by police, many corporations public, uh, publicly expressed their commitment not only to grapple with racial inequities in the economic sphere, but also an increasing racial diversity on their boards, with particular emphasis on black directors. Professor Fairfax's talk today will engage that issue and enlighten us all on the, on the questions uh, that revolve around board diversity. Professor Fairfax is the director of the GW Corporate Law and Governance Initiative. Uh, in addition to many, many law review articles, she's authored a book entitled, Shareholder Democracy, a Primer on Shareholder Activism and Participation. Uh, she's held a number of positions, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, received many honors, uh, and please join me in welcoming Professor Lisa Fairfax. Thank you so much, Dean Johnson. And um, I, I want to say a special thank you to you and Professor Ashrapur for inviting me to speak today. I also just want to say that to the Davis community how lucky you are to have the type of leadership that you do in your dean and professors, they are outstanding lights in the corporate community. And if you are lucky enough to take a class by either of them, I don't know if the dean is still speaking, but I know the professor is uh, still teaching. If you're lucky enough, you should make sure you take advantage of that because it is so important not just to uh, learn about these important issues, but learn from some of the best, which you have. Um, I gotta say, I was born and raised in California. Um, and the truth of the matter is anytime anybody invites me to California to speak, I always say yes. <laughs> and even though I wasn't invited, it, invited in person, I, I am so happy to say uh, yes uh, to engage with you, of course, around this very, very important uh, topic. Um, you know, it's true, of course, last summer's uh, police shooting of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other unarmed Black men and women clearly created racial awareness and racial reckoning um, uh, around how we engage um, the issue of Black lives and um, the lives of uh, people of color. And corporations responded like many others, not only in trying to 
uh, proactively engage uh, racial inequities more broadly, but also making commitments about what they were going to do in their own shops, in their own corporate ecosystem, right? And this internal commitment took a lot of different forms, but of course, one of the forms was the commitment to, ver to diversify the board um, by increasing the number of racial and ethnic directors and particularly the number of black directors on their board. And I've got to say the corporate commitment to increasing board diversity begs an important question. That is, what exactly does board diversity have to do with anything? <laughs> That is, what does this have to do with this call to um, enhance racial equity in the economic sphere? So my talk today is going to try to answer that question and try to answer it with two in two ways. The first is my talk is going to say that board diversity is a necessary, though far from sufficient response to the calls for increasing and improving racial equity in the economic space. Second, though, I'm going to argue that while this current environment presents an opportunity, I think, to enhance board diversity, there remains important challenges around our ability to do so. And those challenges actually relate to um, the continued failure to really reckon with kind of racial biases and racial discrimination in the corporate sphere, particularly with regard to boards, right, since that's what we're talking about. And that failure could have an impact on whether or not we've turned a corner. I want to pause right now and say to you that when I use the term board diversity in this setting, I'm talking specifically about diversity with respect to race and ethnicity, with a particular focus on Black people. Um, it's my belief that, you know, because we're talking about the response to this summer's racial reckoning, which is a response to whether or not Black lives matter, we need to discuss and deal with the, the viability of that response through the prism of race and black lives. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on. First, I would just say, you know, in this question of why does board diversity matter? On the one hand, I think if you have been paying attention to the Black Lives Matter movement, there's a reason to be skeptical about why the focus on boards matters, right? To the extent that the Black Lives Matter movement has focused on an economic agenda, it's focused on the workforce more broadly, and it's focused on grappling with inequities that have left significant wage, income, savings, and wealth disparities in the economic sphere. Um, in discussing the economic agenda related to the Black Lives Matter movement, one commentator has said that the point of the economic agenda is to disrupt policies that foster inequities and, quote, begin the process of economic empowerment, especially for the most economically marginalized in the Black communities. In the context of that statement, one can legitimately wonder, how does a policy that aims at increasing the number of Blacks and other people of color on corporate boards, most of whom are not economically marginalized, how is that a part of this racial reckoning? My response is it's absolutely a part, right? And it's a part for at least three reasons. Um, the first, and what I think is the most important reason, is that the lack of board diversity is actually a visible sign of the racial inequity in the broader workforce and economy. It's true, America's boards are not diverse. 37% of S&P 500 boards do not have a single Black director. Blacks only account for 10% of directors at the largest S&P 500 companies, and when you get to smaller companies, that number gets smaller and smaller. Studies of boards over the last few decades have shown that the number of Black directors has not only stalled, but has decreased, right? This lack of diversity represents a symptom, actually, of the broader problem of racial inequities in the economic sphere, a symptom of a broader problem that reflects racial bias and discrimination. A robust array of studies revealed that at every stage of the economic labor market, people of color in general, and Black people in particular face race-based discrimination and bias. That has not changed in the decades since anti-discrimination laws were passed seeking to address that bias and discrimination. At the hiring stage, at the workforce stage, and in the workforce, through promotion and retention, Blacks and other people of color face significant obstacles that undermine their ability to advance to the top slots. The lack of board diversity is a continuation of these policies, right? 
Given that the road to the C-suite is actually littered with racial bias and discrimination, the road and the discrimination that impedes progress down that road has led to a lack of diversity. I believe that lack of diversity, particularly in the C-suite and in the board are canaries in the coal mine, signals of the significant racial barriers that serve to impede Black's advancement. A Harvard Business Review study put it this way, according to both quantitative and qualitative data, working African-Americans from those laboring in factories to those on the shop floor, to those setting C-suite strategy, still face obstacles to advancement that other minorities and white women do not. Studies consistently link those obstacles to persistent racial bias and discrimination that has not declined in some 50 years. Diversifying the board, therefore, is linked to this broader effort to acknowledge these racial barriers and eradicate them um, in the economic sphere. The second reason why board diversity matters is that addressing board diversity is a signal actually of credibility. Quite frankly, we've been here before. And by been here before, I mean, we've been to a place where corporations purport to be equal opportunity employers who care about racial equity and racial justice. Too often, however, their words do not mirror their actions and have no impact actually on their actions. Indeed, in this current racial reckoning, many of the corporations that have spoken out and committed to racial equity have also admitted that their formal efforts have fallen short, right? Why should we take the black squares, the heartfelt statements and the poignant commercials seriously? One way to take them seriously is for companies to diversify their board. As one set of Ernst & Young researchers note, the lack of racial and ethnic board diversity, quote, speaks for itself and likely sends a stronger signal to investors, employees, and other stakeholders about the company's messaging in this area. In other words, if your board isn't diverse, how are we to trust your messaging around diversity and racial equity more broadly? Third, Addressing board diversity matters because it increases the likelihood that corporations will focus on issues of racial equity. And it increases the likelihood that corporations will be held accountable for whether and to what extent they focus on these issues. Here, I wanna be very careful not to overstate or overpromise. Boards have limits. Boards do not get involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of the corporation. And thus, there are a plethora of racial policies and practices that are beyond the board's purview. And there are a plethora of matters that the 10 to 12 person board will just not be able to catch or oversee because boards have limits. Individual directors have limits. There is considerable and consistent literature about the importance of critical mass. The fact that without at least three Right, individual directors may not feel comfortable raising different views, and when they raise those views, they may not be heard. Also, it is very, very important that we not discount the important role and responsibility that white directors have to play in this moment and with respect to this issue. We cannot move the needle on addressing racial inequities unless there is some type of buy-in, some type of voice, some type of support from everybody else on the board. However, boards do play a very important role in tone setting and expectation setting. They ask questions, they set expectations, they set priorities, they set measurable goals, or at least they can. Boards also can play a very important role in terms of accountability. They can follow up. They can tie expectations to meaningful consequences. They can help the corporation stay vigilant. It's also true that individual directors can, in fact, alter the conversation and the perspective in the boardroom. Empirical research demonstrates this. It indicates that just one different person in a group can change the conversation. They can change what's said and often what's not said, what people are not willing to say. Having one person adds an important perspective at the highest levels of the corporate enterprise so that we can increase the likelihood that diverse initiative, diverse programs, diverse impacts will be considered at those levels. While critical mass is of course important, it's also true, and the research shows this, that many of the directors who end up sitting on the board 
are used to being the only. And therefore, they're used to understanding how to navigate situations where they have to influence in those types of settings. So they can make a difference. And finally, while clearly you want to have support and buy in from other directors, it's often the case that other directors, other white directors, other white allies actually won't speak up without prodding, without support from people of color and their black colleagues. It turns out that critical mass is important for them as well. If they don't feel the support, then they too will not raise their voice. That means without Black directors in the room where it happened, I am an Alexander Hamilton fan, <laughs> um, it is much less likely that the kinds of issues that we're interested in being addressed will, be, will surface and will get addressed. So board diversity is by no means a cure-all. I don't want to suggest that it's going to solve all the racial ills associated with the corporate world and with the economic world more broadly, but it's an important starting place, setting an important tone in the corporation, signaling a, uh, credibility, and it's in a very important part of the solution to eliminating the racial disparities in the economic labor market. So now I get to that second question. Are we at a place where we're going to achieve meaningful diversity on boards? On the one hand, there's lots of reasons to be optimistic. There's a whole bunch of corporations that have voluntarily pledged to increase the racial um, and ethnic diversity on their boards, including increasing the number of black directors on their board. Shareholders have been pushing, right, saying that they expect companies to increase diversity. In New York, there are initiatives pursuant to which shareholders have sent letters to dozens of companies saying that they want those companies to implement a Rooney type rule. I'm a huge uh, football fan. The Rooney rule um, uh, named uh, uh, after the Steelers is a rule that essentially um, says that when you consider important positions, you have to have people of color in the pool, right? So the idea is whenever there's a board vacancy, you have to have people of color and black people in the pool. California, the great state leading the way in this, right? Mandating that boards that have their principal office in California have at least one underrepresented minority on their board, similar to their gender diversity rule. NASDAQ now has a disclosure based proposal pursuant to which they're asking boards to either comply by having at least one underrepresented minority on their board or explain why they think that's not necessary. This type of activity has been promising before. This combination of voluntary corporate compliance, increased shareholder pressure, regulatory initiatives has worked and has significantly impacted gender diversity on boards to such an extent that there has been a surge in the number of women directors on boards and a surge of the percentages of women in each new class of directors. Um, so all of these things uh, are promising. Nevertheless, I have concerns. Um, and I've got to say, I am cautious. And really the reason why I'm cautious is because we're dealing with race, right? So the first and most important thing that's a, a note of caution is this is about race. And what history has taught us is that when it comes to matters of race and ethnicity, those things prove particularly challenging. All right. I've been writing about board diversity for decades, as have many people in the corporate uh, ecosystem. And yet, we come to the situation that there are significant strides being made with respect to gender, but race has lagged behind, right, for whatever reason. But the reason is because it's about race. And race has always proven to be particularly challenging. Second, there is this huge reluctance to prioritize race. What I find very, very interesting um, and a potential problem is while legislatures, corporations, um, both in the past and even now have been very upfront about their desire for gender diversity. And let me be clear, I'm a woman, I care about gender diversity, <laughs> um, but it is the case that while there's been this clarity around wanting and advocating around gender diversity, the same thing cannot be said for race. 
right? Even the California rule and the NASDAQ rule has a definition of underrepresented minorities, right? That creates the possibility that corporations can comply without adding a single racial or ethnic minority to their board, right? You also see it with regard to the SEC and their reluctance to define diversity when it comes to especially race and ethnicity. Like all of a sudden now we don't wanna put a label on it. And quite frankly, it is the whole reason and the impetus behind the Black Lives Matter movement to get people to say Black Lives Matter is such a huge deal because of our difficulty with kind of understanding that if you don't prioritize it and say it, it's not going to get done. I will also point out that there's this, this, this desire to talk about diversity and divorce it from race and ethnicity and even gender. A 2017 Deloitte survey found that 95% of survey respondents who were boards and um, members of boards and, and uh, executives, 95% of them believed that board diversity was vital. 90% of them believe that diversity of a board could be achieved um, uh, without having race and ethnic and gender diversity, right? And I've got to tell you, this idea that you could get a diversity of experience or diversity of perspective or ideologies without race and ethnicity and gender is inconsistent with reality. And it's actually just a form of bias. Why do I say that? Because all of the empirical evidence to, to date suggests that the only way corporate boards to date have increased their diversity of experience and perspective, right, is by increasing race, gender, and ethnic diversity. Those directors, that is directors that have a racial diversity or gender or ethnicity, those are the directors that actually bring differences in professional experience, differences in background, differences in age, right, as composed to their white counterparts. That means that when you have a board that's all white, it's much more likely that you're going to have a narrow range of professions represented, a narrow range of backgrounds and experiences represented. Moreover, let's not kid ourselves. Race, gender, and ethnicity continue to be key determinants of people's experiences and perspectives. So adding diversity without also increasing race and uh, ethnicity and gender, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. Right. And the move to try to define diversity without defining and using race and gender is a head fake. <laughs> right. It's really a move to shift away from that. Um, so that's something important to keep in mind. The third thing that is a problematic is this insistence on doubling down on board nomination and, uh, and selection processes, as well as board criteria that have proven to perpetuate the racial status quo, right? What do I mean by that? I mean that despite the professed desire for board diversity, boards and their nominating committees continue to use things that have proven to be ineffective in terms of diversifying their board. First, corporations and their boards persist with a heavy reliance on a process that is flawed. Surveys reveal that close to 80% of boards continue to rely on current board members, traditional social and professional networks, and traditional search firms, even when they say they're actively seeking board candidates who are Black or people of color. Hello, those don't work, right? So what exactly are you doing by doubling down on those things? The most recent survey on board practices found that only 8% of boards relied on organizations committed to diversity when they were seeking to diversify their board. Instead, again, they relied on channels, resources that were guaranteed to reproduce the status quo, All right? So what's wrong with that picture? The other thing that continues to happen, although there's a little bit less of it, is corporations continue to heavily rely on CEO or former CEO status or C-seat status when they are seeking to um, fill their board seats. 
all of the research says that if you do that, you undermine the ability to diversify your board. Here's the thing, corporations and their boards contain the most entrepreneurial and innovative people in the country, if not the world, or so we've been told. And yet they refuse to acknowledge that in order to get a different result, you have to do something different, right? I was told as early as grade school that continuing to do the same thing over and over again and expecting something different was the definition of something that we're hoping our boards are not. So it's unclear why there's this doubling down uh, and this refusal to try something different, if you will. Fourth, I've got to call out the racial bias that actually pervades how we even engage on this issue of board diversity. There is quite frankly, a form of differential treatment, which is a form of racial bias that emerges when it comes to how we treat the desired focus on diversity as compared to how we treat focus on other characteristics and qualifications associated with being a board member. What do I mean by that? When it comes to things that impede racial diversity, for example, CEO status, the corporate community has been absolutely willing to embrace that characteristic without a shred of meaningful empirical evidence showing that there is a link between that status and corporate or board performance. They've just taken it on faith. How do I know? Because I've looked for the studies and there's almost none, which shows that they don't even bother to research the question. <laughs> More importantly, the limited studies out there reveal that there's actually a negative correlation between that status and corporate or board performance, especially between having so many on the board um, and corporate and board performance. But again, we've just kind of ignored that and taken it on faith. And I'm not saying that the faith is wrong. Right. It seems to me intuitively right to suggest that people who have kind of uh, C-suite experience, et cetera, could have a meaningful value add to the board. But I just want to tell you, we've taken it on faith. By very, very sharp contrast, we have not taken it on faith that board diversity adds any value to the company. Right. Even though intuitively it makes sense right? Different perspectives will offer different, right, ideas. Like it, it makes sense intuitively. But let me tell you, the corporate community has not been willing to take it on blind faith. How do I know? Because there's a virtual avalanche of studies seeking to prove that there's a link between board diversity and corporate performance. Why do those studies exist? It is clear that those studies exist because the corporate community has not been willing to take it on faith. They have said, prove it. Perhaps more importantly, the corporate community has been unwilling to embrace board diversity, even when there have been studies suggesting a positive correlation between that diversity and corporate and board performance. What do people say? Oh, the evidence is mixed or it's flawed or we think it's non-existent or it's negative, fine. That's not my point. My point is, on the one hand, when we deal with characteristics that don't do anything to enhance diversity, we're not asking anybody to prove it. But when we deal with something that relates to diversity, we say, prove your worth prove your value add or else we have the ability, the responsibility, I guess, not to embrace that characteristics. This demand for proof is a form of racial bias that we call, and not we, <laughs> that sociologists um, and others that engage with race and race bias uh, issues call a presumption of incompetence. Blacks, people of color are presumed incompetent and as a result, they must prove their worth often repeatedly. And they especially, the studies show, have to prove their worth the higher they get up the corporate ladder. By contrast, whites have a presumption of competence. They don't have to prove that they add value. 
The presumption is that they do. And that's true, even when they sometimes make mistakes, which everybody does, right? They're giving the flexibility, right? And the presumption that they have value and they have worth, but we are told to prove it. And this very differential treatment in the way we even talk about diversity is a part of the problem. So race matters. You cannot address racial inequities without addressing the racial bias and discrimination that has produced those inequities. And this is true with regard to board diversity as well. So while I of course believe that board diversity is an important part of the solution, and I believe that there are some reasons to be optimistic, um, time will tell. <laughs> Because I think even now there are disturbing signs that companies and their boards are not really turning the corner. And if board diversity is the canary in the coal mine, if we cannot move the needle with respect to this, it suggests that we're not going to be able to move the needle on these other issues related to racial inequity in the workforce and in the economy more generally. And that is truly disturbing. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention, and I am happy to entertain questions. Hey, well, we have our first question coming in from a esteemed colleague of yours, Dina Sharapur, and she says, can you explain a little bit more on your thoughts on the legislations in California what aspects of the legislation should other states look to and what are its shortcomings? So um, I think this is true. I've mentioned this both California and NASDAQ. You know, the, quite frankly, the great thing about the California is that it's a mandate. Let's just be real. <laughs> um, and while of course it's going to be subject to all kinds of challenges, Right. In between now and then, <laughs> it's likely that you're going to get a lot of, of movement. Um, and so, right, the hope is that other states will follow on because it is true that the gender diversity mandate uh, um, has had an impact on the level of gender diversity in California. Notwithstanding the fact that everyone knew out the gate that it was going to be subject to all types of challenges. Generally speaking, Many companies will say, you know, it's not worth it. Let's just try to let's just try to comply, right? Uh, and quite frankly, once that compliance occurs, right, it's going to have a, a, a snowballing effect. Um, so, so I think that's important. The other thing that I think is important is the definition piece, um, which I talked about. Um, and what I flagged is that while the California and NASDAQ say, look, we want you to have at least one, one seat for gender, like one seat for a woman, when it comes to underrepresented communities, they describe that to include both people of color um, and kind of minority communities and right, members who identify as LGBTQ. Now, let me be clear. I think that you should have that type of diversity on your board, but I don't think that they should come together, right? If what you're trying to do is advance racial and ethnic diversity, then that's what you should do. And there should, you know, there should just be I mean, one, just the same way people did with regard to gender. So I do think that those need to be decoupled, right? If we're trying to advance um, um, diversity, then you know, say three, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, many boards, when they engage in diversifying their board, they just expand the board. So if that's what you have to do to comply, I think that's perfectly fine. Um, I would also say, um, and, you know, I think the great thing about the NASDAQ proposal uh, is actually that it is pushing for disclosure. Right. Um, and all of the studies suggest that with respect in particular to race and ethnicity, um, and of course with gender identity, you need the boards to get the information. Like you're not gonna be able to, we're not gonna be able to figure it out our, ourselves. And the last study I read said that something like 10% of Russell 3000 boards disclose the, right, the kind of demographic characteristics of their board. 
right? And we all know if we can't measure it, it won't matter. Uh, so that's something that that is an important piece of the response um, and something that need, needs to happen if we really want to see momentum in this area. Great, thank you. We have another question from Patty who says, please discuss about having so-called Uncle Tom board members appointed to comply with the diversity quota and the potential dilemma that that can create. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, on the one hand, I appreciate um, absolutely the concern that race, ethnicity, and even gender is not a proxy for a viewpoint, right? So sometimes there is this concern that if what you're trying to do is to ensure that corporations are engaging more broadly around progressive policies, um, then it's the case that it's not necessarily true that um, um, all Blacks, all women, all Latinas, Latinx, et cetera, will share the same viewpoint, right? So you could get the so-called, um, I, I would say, I think that concern is um, uh, overstated. Um, first, I would just remind you that one of the reasons why I think board diversity is important is because it is a part of the overarching response to addressing racial equities. And so it's not, it's not necessarily linked to this idea that the board member has to now be progressive when they get there or have to otherwise, but rather just linked to the board member, regardless of their ideology, has likely faced obstacles in their progression through the corporate sphere. And this is one way um, um, to reflect that you're trying to deal with those obstacles, right? Um, because the whole point of Black Lives Matter is no cop is stopping to ask you what your racial, your ideology is before they harass you, right? Because race matters. <laughs> Um, and that's what we're trying to uh, respond to. Uh, I guess I would also say that you know you, you need to be very careful around uh, you know that Uncle Tom label, um, you know, because it is the case that while on the one hand many Black board members share the same economic, social, sometimes professional background as their white counterparts, right? It's also the truth that you know race, gender. Um, ethnicity, um, regardless of your viewpoint, impacts your perspective, right, around particular issues. And that's really what we're talking about here. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, whether or not they will come out in the same place is not the expectation. Whether or not they will be able to add a perspective that's missing from the room is. Um, but of course, finally, I have said, I said, right, it's not a cure-all. Right, um, and that you may, in 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 fact, end up at a place where you have to do more, right? So it's a part of the solution. So I guess my answer to you is I'm not concerned, right, about the type of black person you end up putting on the board, and and you know because, especially because too often it turns out that progressive white people on the board don't do any more than the conservative black person in terms of advancing particular policies. Thank you. Um, Samantha says, what do you think board leadership can do to better prepare existing directors to acknowledge the importance of diversity and better work with new diverse colleagues? So that's a really good question. Um, boards are, you know, and this is part of what I meant when I said, um, you know, this is not something that's just on the shoulders or the one or two or three, you know, women, people of color that you end up getting on uh, your board, but this is the work of the entire board and the entire corporation and responding effectively and meaningfully to kind of issues of racial, racial equity, including um, at the board level is about surfacing unconscious bias, right, in many different ways. So whether or not they, you know, one of the things they can do is to talk about it, right? One of the things that, and I'm now, I'm on a nonprofit board and, you know, one of the things that I have learned is you've got to name it. <laughs> You've got to say, right, we're getting ready to go into these conversations. You need to understand where your biases are. And we all have them, 
right? And you need to acknowledge and appreciate them before we engage in this conversation. So what can a board chair do? Set the tone, say, I have to acknowledge my own, right? Say we're going to, in fact, right, have training around this, right? We go, right, they can both set agendas, set priorities, right? Create a culture where even if you don't have one person of color, one woman on the board, which you should, but in, until you do, you can still have these conversations, right? You can still engage around these issues. You can still do the work that needs to be done. You don't need to wait for somebody to tell you to do it. Uh, in a follow-up to that, I'm talking about a different group of people. We had a question from Andrew who says, what are some actions students can take to increase board diversity? You know, I will say that there's been a lot of research, especially actually in the corporate community about the impact that this generation is having on all of these conversations, right? I will say, and I didn't mention this in my talk because I couldn't mention everything, but I will say one of the reasons of optimism around this new push for racial reckoning is the incredible power and expectations of other stakeholders, right? We are living in this moment where people beyond shareholders have, can and do have an impact on the corporation and what it says and what it does, right? What was the reason for the black squares and the post about we care? And it was actually a push from customers and clients and consumers, right? And part of that push is this younger generation who grew up during a time, even if it wasn't true, where there's an expectation about what the world is supposed to look like and how we're supposed to engage. And that generation, what can you as a student do, actually continue to do what students have actually been doing, this younger generation, which is to put your money where your mouth is. And what we have seen increasingly is that this generation is willing to do that, make investment choices that are driven by things that they care about, make consumer choices that are driven by things that they care about, issues that they care about. And because of the visibility, like who knows what a board looks like or who's on it. Now we could like click a button and we can see, right? Um, who knows whether or not they are for or against particular policies, but the answer is now we do know. Because if you haven't said anything on your Twitter account, or you have said something that tells us, and then when you do, we can react. Now, I gotta say that you, we, that there is a measure of responsibility that has to occur because sometimes this can go too far. You know, we can jump on the bad wagon and do things to both businesses and individuals that are inappropriate, but there is incredible power there, right? And using that voice and that power in a very strategic way is really important. Right? I think the other thing as law school students that you can do is to pay attention to the legal landscape, especially when regulators ask for comments. Right? NASDAQ issued a proposal about board diversity, and then they issued a, the SEC issued a call for comments. You could have easily issued, you know, submitted a letter talking about how important that was. And even more powerful, you could have gathered, you and a hundred of your closest classmates could have gathered together and written a letter in support. And you could do the same thing, right? The ability to post something on Twitter that could go viral, right? On Instagram that could go viral is not only a power, right? If used responsibly, it could really move the needle. Something you mentioned NASDAQ, uh, again, we had a question from Callie who says, regarding our discussion of critical mass, do you find the requirements in California and NASDAQ for only one minority to be disingenuous? Um, I don't think it's disingenuous. I mean, obviously critical mass is a, is a concern, um, but you gotta start somewhere, right? Um, because I feel like, isn't it more disingenuous that we have all of these companies, you know, pledging to do the right thing, but not pledging to say, we're gonna at least add one? <laughs> right. Um, we have all of these states that are silent on the issue. Right. So don't be trying to hate on California. No. <laughs> uh, I guess what I'm saying is it has to start somewhere. Right. 
Um, and, and, and what we have seen in the literature is diversity begets diversity. Now, if you had said California started with gender diversity and stopped, I would say that's a, that's a concern. Right. Um, and I was we were talking a little bit uh, be, uh, about this uh, before. Right. Because because what we have seen is too often gender diversity just means white women diversity. That's what it means. Right. That's what all the empirical research says, that all of the other women of color get left behind when you have a gender diversity rule. So if you're trying to increase the number of women of color and increase racial and ethnic diversity, you have to have a rule that gets specifically at that. Um, but it is also the case that, again, diversity begets diversity. What do I mean by that? There is a correlation between the number of di uh, diverse, uh, the number of directors, um, uh, female directors, directors of, uh, of color um, in on the board and with those that presence in the C-suite. Right, there is a correlation. There's also a correlation with the number of right people of color and women on the board and adding more. Right, um, so we got to start somewhere. Um, I, I will say the next thing to focus on um, is, of course, both critical mass and the positions that directors hold on the board. Right, because somebody mentioned this Uncle Tom thing, um, but I would say to you, you know, not every board position is created equal. Right, um, chair of the board is really important. <laughs> Head of the nominating committee or being on the nominating committee really important. Compass, and what do we see when we go that one step down? We see that even in companies that have a lot of women, for example. They're not in those roles that can influence policy at the board level and throughout the company, right? Um, so that's another thing to look at. Can someone ask, right, what can boards do? What can you do as head of a company? If you have women on your board, you need to put them in leadership positions. Don't just have them sitting there, right? Don't just have them, quite frankly, dealing with the race question, right? You deal with the race question. One of the most interesting statistics I saw um, was this statistics, not a statistic, but this, uh, that basically said the only people who do not suffer negative repercussions for talking about race are white men. So you talk about race and let me talk about finance and governance. <laughs> are you lead in that discussion and let me just time in. That's actually something else you can do for me as we start to engage these issues. We have a question here from Professor Suchak who writes about a term that I actually have not heard before, but I think I'll use it. And that is in academia, we've seen a push to get white men to refuse to serve on manals, all male panels or all white panels. Yeah. Have you seen a similar push with corporate boards has there been a move to pressure or inspire white men to refuse to serve on non-diverse boards? So there has not. It's an interesting, but yes, there is such a thing as mantles. <laughs> um, this idea that you know you shouldn't be a part of the problem. Uh, um, there hasn't been a similar push in the corporate uh, world. Um, I'm free. Is, don't quote me on this, but it's being recorded. So I'm going to say it is my understanding that Serena Williams' husband, who is white, stepped down from his board seat uh, and said, I want you to fill the seat with a person of color. All right. So you have these individual acts where people are saying, like, this is unacceptable, and I'm going to be the one to say, like, I'm, this is not going to. Um, but you know, no, we have not seen that same type of, of movement um, at all in the board sphere. And, and in fact, um, you know, one of the concerns I heard raised with regard to the NASDAQ proposal is this concern that you know, it's going to displace white men um, and it's going to you know, lead to us pushing them out at some uh, level. Um, and, and I could just tell you in response, the vast majority of companies that have diversified their board with race or gender have done so by expanding the board and not displacing anyone or otherwise by waiting for board members to step down. 
moreover, the research, the last research I looked at said that, you know, even as boards have diversified, they have still the most likely person to get a board seat in today's world is a white man. Right. It's still that way. So there's not, um, but I would say I'd be all in. I, I think that's the other thing you can do if you're sitting on the board and it doesn't require you stepping down. You can just expand and say, I don't want to be on this board if we're not going to really take this seriously. And that's a way to kind of really lead. Great. I, 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 I just want to say one more thing because I, I think, um, you know, the white voice here is extremely important. And I just want to be clear that I, there are colleagues in the corporate space, um, white male colleagues, um, I won't name them all, but in the white, and some of them you would think of as conservative um, that I have dealt with that have never ever put a panel together of all white men. <laughs> Um, and I have been shocked about that. Like what has made, right? And the reason why I've been shocked is because I have come, I have also come to panels, manals, <laughs> put together by so-called progressive white people, right? Which goes to like, it's not necessarily about ideology. Some people will just, right, for whatever reason, realize it's not okay and do something about it on their own. Um, and so that's the other thing as students, you should understand that too. You should not be putting leadership teams together, panels together, right? Symposiums together, right? Nothing should be done. If you care about these issues should be done without that very important lens. And it's not good enough for you to say, we called Professor Fairfax and she was unavailable, right? That's like your one black friend couldn't do it and then you stopped, come on. Um, we have a question from Bill, who is curious about um, how we unfortunately see so much um, income disparities within minority households, uh, particularly among Black households and, and other minority groups. So if we have this kind of um, financial disparity, and you're talking about a corporate board, and they're looking at stocks and uh, fiscal clout, how does that impact the discussion on board diversity? So it's a very good question. And remember, that's what I was kind of saying, you know, what is exactly the link? You know, quite frankly, I would say uh, board positions, in case you don't know, on for-profit boards, they do come with money. <laughs> so automatically, if you, you know, make a black person a director, you're lining their pocket and having an impact, even in that very small way. And it's not small because board positions beget board positions. It's a very economically exclusive club, but it comes with some um, uh, impact. Uh, uh, and, you know, what the, what the data shows is the exclusion of blacks and people of color and women from these very, uh, advanced positions in the corporate sphere is part of the problem, right? They cannot right, reach the highest levels that also have income associated with it. And that um, is important. On this broader question, right, um, uh, about and what does kind of having a, someone like that on the board mean for moving the needle on these kind of economic inequity questions? Um, you know, what I said is what I said in my talk. Right? I think you have a greater likelihood of increasing the profile of those issues, right? Um, you know, there, there's a greater a heightened awareness and understanding because the truth of the matter is that in the Black community, in other communities, uh, minority communities, um, the generational wealth has not been such that there aren't people in their families who are in a totally different economic situation than they are. So they have a much better understanding of how these policies impact the working class, the et cetera. And there's a much greater likelihood that there will be an attention to these policies, an appreciation about how they impact wealth uh, and income and saving disparities and a desire to have something done about it. Um, but remember, I said, this isn't the panacea, right? A lot of these policies are outside of the purview of the board, but the board can ask the questions. They can set the tone. Right? They can ask for the studies about the right, um, income, salary, wage disparities in their own company, about the impact of the policies at their own companies, and then figure out how best to deal with it. Okay, and I think this will be our, our final question here. Um, 
we had from Arthur who says, or more um, a comment and question, UC Davis Health has racial healing circles. How do we motivate corporate boards to participate or encourage these type of um, healing circles around the questions of race? Um, I would say what, I'm not sure what a racial healing circle is. <laughs> <laughs> is that just a, a coming together where we talk about race, issues of race? Um, I, I'm sorry that I can't tell you either. I am putting a link in the chat. Um, this is one of our colleagues at UC Davis that um, was included. But yes, I would I would go on that assumption of, of bringing people together to discuss these sensitive and complex issues. Yeah, I mean, you know, you encourage it just by doing it. Like there's, it's not, there's not a magic wandy thing. Like if you're chair of the board, if you're CEO of a company, like you got to make the decision that these are conversations that we want to try to engage in responsibly, right? So don't just do it, but try to do, do it responsibly because, you know, race is a very challenging issue for everybody in the room. So don't just launch into some discussion where then everybody leaves mad. <laughs> but, but but try to you know try to get some get some help <laughs> right around how do we responsibly engage this questions i would also say allow people grace right these are very difficult conversations for everybody in the room right and if you have a ceo likely white because that's the <laughs> complexion of most CEOs uh, and they're deciding to lead on this issue, give them the room to make mistakes around this issue because, right, we need to give people grace if you're going to engage in this conversation, but also give people room to not engage, especially the Black people and the people. Too often these discussions end up, right, what Blacks or people of color, the women, we just mad and we crying and we all feel with emotion. Our whole day is ruined. And you guys, I feel great, right? <laughs> so give us a room to opt out <laughs> um, and to deal with the anger, right? Um, um, because you can't, right, get to healing until we've kind of looked at the scab and applied the medicine and done, right, all of the stuff it takes to actually heal in a genuine way way, which takes a very long time. So real conversations, real reckoning, real healing around this takes a very long time, which is why I said the board diversity is the canary in the coal mine. Because at some level, the board diversity is like, that's like easy. I'm sorry, just put somebody on your board. The racial reckoning, the grappling with the income and wealth, that's really hard. It was going to take a long time. All right. So if you're going to credibly commit to doing that, right, you need to send us a signal that's more than just a black square. And I'll leave it there. <laughs> well, thank, thank you all for, for being here today. Uh, thank you, Professor Fairfax, for your insightful remarks. And uh, thank, thank everybody for ask, posing challenging questions. Uh, this speaker series will continue on January 25th with the Yolo County Public Defender, Tracy Olson, talking. Uh, so I hope you can join us then, too. But thanks very much, and take good care. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone, uh, for those questions and for you listening and engaging around what is clearly an extremely important topic.